We are um, live on Facebook and we are recording for those who might come afterwards to uh, look at this presentation. There's some of us who are gathered here physically, some of us who are um, will join us or are joining us now. And so we wanna get started because we have an absolutely fabulous guest today. <laughs> Father, <laughs> Father Bertie Pearson is the rector of Grace Church in Waringen, Texas, is it? We are in Georgetown, Texas, which Georgetown, is Texas. it's sort of Georgetown is to Austin what I don't know Glendale is to LA or something. We're 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 just a suburb basically or something. Right, <laughs> we're right. abutting. Yeah, excellent. Um, Bertie also teaches church history as an adjunct at um, Seminary of the Southwest, I believe. Right mm -hmm. in Austin. That's right. And then through the Iona. Um, Collective is that what they call it, or what? yeah, it's I own a school for ministry is the actual school title, for ministry, but yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you can also you'll you'll share any more of your own biography that you would like to share. You have a cool biography though, because I think you're the only priest. Our junior warden used to play drums in a punk group, um, but I think other than him, you're the only the only well, you're the only priest that I know who used to do that, except probably Chris Rankin Williams maybe did. I don't know. Um, but um uh and your your Lynn Crow, who is also here, Mother Lynn, she's also a CDSP alum, as are you and as am I. And um we were there in the we were all there, you were there towards the end of the glory days of CDSP with the great <laughs> professors that we all shared. Um and, but today you're going to be talking about church history, and the reason I discovered you was by listening to your uh, aptly named podcast called The History of Christianity, or History of the Church, with Bertie Pearson. <laughs> very, very, uh, very nicely named. Um, and I just fell on that uh, when I was just browsing through podcasts. And I was just so impressed with you because you were able to um, digest so much really significant elements of the early church, which sometimes can be communicated in a very dry sort of way, in, in a lively way, and through with a lot of really good humor um, as well. And so you're, you're a fabulous teacher. Um, I think I'm, I'm not playing it up too much, I hope. Um, and uh, we're so glad that you're here today. You know, um, do you want to say anything more about yourself, about what we're talking about today or as we start out? One really important note is that I've just begun my sabbatical. So we will be uh, leaving for mostly France, but a little time in Italy in a week and a half. But it means that today I am home. So we're in, I'm in my home office. There's a dog next to me. There's a seven-year-old in the living room and a two-year-old sleeping in a bedroom. So at any point there might be crazy interruptions just to let yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thanks. I'm just, uh, it's, I'm overjoyed to be here today. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. And the other thing too, that, that we're, we're talking about, like, you know, the, the, the history of the church is obviously a broad topic <laughs> um, in, in many ways, but we're, we're focusing on, on the, the, the centuries, the first, first few centuries um, that the church began to develop. And I am convinced that, that the wisdom of those early centuries has a lot to say to um, the imperial world in which we also live um, mm -hmm. in, in uh, it, it's not in some ways very different, but in other ways, not so different um, because there is, we, we know we live in um, a post-Christendom world now, right? And so um, when, when uh, Constantine got to that really unfortunate Milvian bridge situation where um, he, he, uh, he, he sees this vision of the cross, et cetera, um, that changed the whole thing, the whole game. And I'm sure at some point, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about that. In fact, the last week is going to focus on that a little bit, but, um, but, but I'm sure you're going to bring to us ways in which the wisdom of those early fathers and mothers, um, the martyrs and the confessors and the teachers, um, 
can speak to us um, in the communion of saints, uh, even today. I will certainly do my best. <laughs> well, why don't we turn it over to you? <clears throat> All right. Well, I should just say that um, when I'm teaching, you know, I really love having conversations with folks. So if anyone has a question or a thought, or if you want to say that makes no sense whatsoever, feel free to grab uh, Father Mark's microphone and just pass it around and uh, feel free to stop me at any point. Let, let me just say in terms of that, the logistics, that if someone has something to contribute, please don't just say it because Bertie won't be able to hear it and neither will anybody else who's listening. So, so make sure that you have the microphone before you speak. That's great. Well, thank you. So I have a little bit of a bait and switch. I promise the history of the church, but we actually have to start with Judaism. So um, initially a trivia question for you. What was involved in the conversion of St. Paul? Don't everyone answer it once. Is that, is that a trick question? <laughs> no, 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 ultimately. So, I mean, I think <clears throat> ultimately sometimes when we think about St. Paul's conversion, there's this sense that St. Paul was this faithful Jewish person, Pharisee of Pharisees, student of Rabbi Gamaliel, perfect under the law, as he says of himself, who then is going along the road to Damascus and has this interaction with Christ. Um, he is blinded. And at that moment, he stops being Jewish and becomes a Christian. It's the conversion of St. Paul from Judaism to Christianity, which is completely insane. St. Paul never stops being Jewish. And in fact, the first generation, the earliest generation of Palestinian Christians also never stopped being Jew Jewish. So I think it's worth kind of delving into what Judaism looked like in the first century before we can kind of move into exploring the church, if that makes sense to everyone. So um, because we are all kind of romantics in some sense, there's a temptation for all of us to see modern Judaism as being this sort of perfect time capsule, as though, you know, you go to a synagogue today, and it's basically what a synagogue was like in the first century, plus electric lights and a microphone. But in fact, Judaism has evolved in the ways that Christianity has evolved. Um, so it's just as naive. I mean, if you thought about um, coming to St. John's this morning, and you're like, you know, I think this is basically what uh, Church of England was like in 1549 or whatever. It's probably closer <laughs> to 1549 and 1552, but it's, it's not, uh, not a sort of perfect time capsule. Things do evolve and change. So, so much of what we do as historians, people looking at history is conjecture. Well, I wonder what it was like back then. Maybe, maybe it was like this, maybe it was like that. And if you think about it, like how much of the stuff in your life the events in your life, the person you are will be remembered and known 2000 years from now. Probably not very much. And you might say, well, you know, I have my online ID and that'll be uh, perpetually on the internet. Maybe or maybe not. In the 1980s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, the British Library was trying to preserve the Domesday Book, this incredibly important survey taken in the 12th century, 11th century uh, in England of kind of surveying the whole country. And they thought, we need a technological solution for this book. We need to preserve it forever on the best technology. And so they got this sort of like early iteration of a laser disc and they put the entire Domesday Book on a laser disc. They took, it took months and months to digitize. It was this grand project. The Laserdisc still exists in the British Library. However, there is no known technology to play it. It is this completely useless <laughs> Frisbee. Yeah. So it may be that everything you have, everything you are, everything about you, nobody will know anything. None of your old receipts will be saved. Your yearbook will have decayed. Your house will be fallen <laughs> into ruins. You know, we won't know anything. St. John's never heard of it. So um, for the most part, this is what we're dealing with as historians. It's all gone. Nobody knows, like nothing is left. Um, occasionally, we find one little touchstone, like an inscription on a statue, or maybe even someone has taken the time to write down the quotidian stuff that in their day was obvious to everyone, St. John's, it's in a city called Los Angeles. Los Angeles is in California. Um, and we actually still have that. And in the case of first century Judaism, we literally have that. There was this guy, Flav Flavius Josephus, or Josephus rather, and Josephus was a uh, military leader. He was a statesperson. 
who was eventually captured by the Romans when the Romans and uh, the, the people of first century Palestine got into some uh, sticky situations. He was later freed and kind of became the translator of first century Judaism to a Roman audience. And we still have a bunch of his books, which is amazing. So we have, it's all from one person's perspective. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. It's his two cents. But he was writing as a historian, telling us what Judaism was like in the first century. And what Josephus reveals is this incredible plurality of Judaisms, some of which look almost nothing like the Judaism of today, which is pretty interesting. So there are these four main schools of Judaism in the first century. And if you want to look to the most official, the like name brand kind of uh, Jewish party in power, it looks almost nothing like today's Judaism. So do you, can you think of a time in the New Testament where we hear about the Sadducees? Does anybody want to shout out anything? What do you know about the Sadducees? Father Mark can't answer because he has a PhD. I can't answer, right. <laughs> <laughs> Please, anybody. Suzanne. Did the Sadducees believe in a, Just uh, what a life Richard after said. death? Yeah, they were. They didn't believe in life after death. They were like, you just go in the ground. That's it. Dead body. Done deal. And Felicia, did you say something? That's what I was asking. If oh, I'm sorry. Believed, if yeah. they believed in a life after death. Yeah, so they were that's all I know about the Sadducees. That's that's a good thing to know. So um, they were they were ardent disbelievers in the life after death. So the Sadducees trace their lineage to Zadok, the priest in the Old Testament. Um, and Zadok has this uh, this dictum that one should not obey God for hope of reward or for fear of punishment. For Zadok, that really meant kind of. I think it's probably something that we as Episcopalians would say that like, you know, the point is not fire insurance. It's not trying to make sure I don't go to hell and I get into this like VIP room of heaven. The point is loving God and loving your neighbor. It's opening your heart to God, opening your heart to love. So that's like, that's the point. It's not about reward and punishment. It's about trying to actually live a life in the image and likeness of God, live a life following Christ. Um, but the way the Sadducees took that is like, there is no reward. There is no punishment. It's just about this life. And according to Josephus, according to some rabbinic historians who are not fans of the Sadducees, we should say, so putting it out there, these guys who are writing about the Sadducees did not love the Sadducees. Their, their take on the Sadducees was that the Sadducees loved this idea, no reward, no punishment, no afterlife, because their whole thing was like, let's be chill about Judaism. Like, why do we need all these rules? Why do we need to be like going to the synagogue all the time? The priests in the temple, they do their thing. And that's basically what Jewish worship is about. It's done on our behalf, and we don't really have to think about it that much. So for the Sadducees, the Bible, the whole Bible, you go to Barnes and Noble, you buy the giant version, it's just five books. It's just the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's it. Joshua, no way. Ruth, haha, ha. Lamentations, never heard of it. The Bible was just the first five books for the Sadducees. That's the whole of the scriptures. And the Sadducees would say that of the 613 commandments in the Torah, almost all of those, with some exceptions, almost all of those are written for people doing stuff in the temple. So it's kind of like a theology. If you were to say like, well, you know, yeah, I'm a member of St. John's. I tithe. I don't go. I don't live as a Christian. Father Mark and the other clergy are doing that stuff for me. Like, I don't, I don't need to do any of this Jesus stuff myself. It's done on my behalf. I'm paying for part of it. I don't want to think about the rest. So the Sadducees, this party which said religion is very much a religion focused on and about the temple priesthood and what's being done in the, in the temple, um, this became the normative party in Judaism. So they controlled relations with the army, they controlled the collection of taxes, of temple taxes, they controlled uh, relations with the Roman Empire, with the king or the ethnarch. Um, so this was the party of power. These were the, the kind of Boston Brahmins, the Mandarins, they were the ones who were sort of the bosses. However, so they're, they're very much the official Judaism, but that's kind of a new phenomenon. So this only happens around 100 BC. Before that, 
you have a different way of being Jewish, which are the other group that we see Christ interacting with a lot in the New Testament. Who would that be, do you think? It starts with a P. Oh, except St. John's is muted. I see people talking, but I don't hear anyone. Momentarily, but now you're back. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear you because you were muted for a sec. Would you say that once more? We lost you momentarily. Oh, no. no. We were at so, the, uh, the description of the of the Sadducees. Okay, so um, I don't know how much of the Sadducees you heard, but basically um, there was this strong emphasis on what was done in the temple uh, and not what was done by the people. So Bible, first five books, all about the temple, not really about the actions of the people. There's another group which uh, was sort of in power before the Sadducees came to power around the year 100 BC. And that group is the Pharisees, this other Jewish group we hear a lot about in the New Testament. So while the Sadducees didn't believe in the afterlife, limited the Bible, the Pharisees were very focused on the afterlife, Olamaba, the world to come. They, um, according to Josephus, even though the Sadducees were kind of the official party, which controlled relations with the army, with the Roman Empire, with the king, levied taxes, controlled the temple, Josephus says the Pharisees have the hearts of the people. So if you are a Jewish person on the street, chances are you identify with Pharisaic Judaism rather than this sort of new powerful party of the Sadducees. So of the, what later gets broken down in the 613 commandments of the Torah, for the Pharisees, these are not just for, not just rules for people engaged in stuff in the temple. This is God's invitation to the path of life for all of God's people. So if you're a Pharisee, everyone in the Jewish household is expected to be doing these good works of God, following these, these positive commandments, the negative commandments, going through everything that's stipulated in Torah to live out this Jewish life, which brings God into every aspect of the day. This term Pharisee comes from Parashim, the abstainers. And so the Sadducees were seen as sort of the new innovative way of being Jewish. The Pharisees abstained from that. They abstained from this new novel way of being Jewish and they were the old school Jewish party. So for the Pharisees, yes, the first five books of Moses, super important, but so were the prophets. And so in, uh, in first century Judaism, prophets are not just limited to like Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth. They would also include what we think of as the historical books as, as the books of, of the prophets. So sometimes Christ will talk about all the law and all the prophets. This is a way of summing up all Holy scripture. In Pharisaic Judaism, the temple is still incredibly important. It's huge. It's just the center of Jewish worship and Jewish life. It is the center of Jewish holiness, but it's something that a typical Jewish person would interact with maybe three times a year, best case scenario. There are these three pilgrimage holidays of uh, the Festival of Booths, of the Passover, and the Festival of Pentecost, in which faithful Jews would come to Jerusalem, they would make sacrifice in the temple, you would know that sacrifice is being done on your behalf, but there's a lot more to Pharisaic Judaism than just temple worship. So for the Pharisees, they include the things that the, Sa the Sadducees are in charge of, but there's a lot more to Judaism than that, if that makes sense. For the Pharisees, there was worship in the synagogue twice a week. So Anywhere in the ancient world that you'd find a Jewish population, you would either find a physical synagogue or you would find people meeting together on the Sabbath, on Saturday, for worship. Does anybody remember what happened in the reading from Acts this morning? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so look, this morning... look it up for us. Is okay, that... yeah. <laughs> Check it out. So this morning, we see this early apostolic group come to a new city, and they're like, well, looking around. Oh, yeah, please. Got it? Let us know. Well, they met Lydia, the, the dealer in purple cloth, and went home with and her. And where, where did they meet her? Um, where was she? On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where there was supposed to, 
there, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. So we, we got to the city. We don't see any synagogue. I suppose there's probably a place of prayer down by the river. Like there must be some kind of camp meeting down by the riverside. So they go to find the Jewish community because the Jewish community is going to be gathered for prayer on the Sabbath. So if you don't have a physical synagogue, you still have the community of a synagogue if there's a Jewish population in your city. And all the teaching there is going to be this Pharisaic model of Judaism. So the Pharisees have a larger canon of scripture, not just the first five books, but it's not a set canon of scripture. So this is uh, like the book, all these are, these are inventions of the first century. Before the codex or the book was invented, everything was done with scrolls in, the, in uh, Israel, Palestine. So in a sense, your canon of scripture was which scrolls you had in your big cabinet of scrolls. So some synagogues, all synagogues would certainly have the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. All the synagogues would most likely have the really important, really big prophets like Isaiah. But who knows whether or not you have Obadiah. Maybe you have Ruth and not Esther. Maybe you have Lamentations and not Jeremiah. You know, who knows? But you, you read from the scrolls which you have. So the canon is not this absolutely set grouping of texts. It's kind of a wide range of texts within boundaries. So it's not as though you could show up to the synagogue and say like, I want to, um, I have this new scroll, which I'm going to dedicate to the synagogue. I had it printed. It was really expensive. It's the Bhagavad Gita. And they'd say like, get out of here. We don't want that. So it's, they, there is a sort of set collection of works, but whether or not you have all those works is anyone's guess. So the canon more flexible in Pharisaic Judaism. Josephus also tells us about this other group called the Essenes, and they're very mysterious. We still don't know a lot about the Essenes, even though we have not only his witness, but also the witness of some Jewish and also some ancient Roman writers. So one ancient Roman writer tells us that there are these communities of Essenes that live out in the desert, and they're all male communities, and uh, this Roman writer says they're the only community in the world that never has children yet grows by the day. So they look a lot like, in some ways, what we would think of as Christians as monastic life in the way that a group of nuns come together and live in the wilderness, a group of monks come together and live in a building in the city, and they're sort of living this isolated life, which is totally focused on experiencing the holiness of God. So. The Essenes believe in the afterlife. They believe that worship in the temple is important, but they believe that the current temple, so in the first century, this is the second temple. If you remember, if you know your Bible, the first temple gets destroyed by the Babylonians. You remember the Babylonians sweep in, they bulldoze everything, they deport a huge portion of the Jewish population. They're gone for a generation and a half. Everybody comes back and they start building the second temple. The first temple, Temple of Solomon, big grand building. The second temple, pretty humble and small until a sort of quasi-Jewish king comes along um, 600 years later and builds the big temple that you get in Jesus' day. But that big temple that you get is missing a lot of stuff. So you remember in the Old Testament, the importance of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant is missing from the second temple. So that big holy box that has all the holy stuff in it that you keep in the Holy of Holies, well, it's not actually there. They don't have that. Even more importantly, missing from the second temple is the glory cloud, the luminous cloud of God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, which comes and encompasses the temple, hovers over the temple. So we read about... Um, like in the story of the transfiguration. What happens in the transfiguration? You have Jesus and two disciples, and they go up a mountain into what? Do you remember? Is it like a cloud? It's a luminous cloud. Right. It's exactly the way the, the glory cloud, which descends over the first temple, is described. It's God, the Holy Spirit. It is the kind of visible, tangible experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
So that's missing from the second temple. You can't just pass by the temple and be like, yep, Holy Spirit, right there. I see this giant, glorious, luminous cloud. It's just a building. So for the Essenes, they maintained a lot of the temple ritual. They maintained a lot of the priestly purification rites, a lot of the priestly activities and teachings, but they didn't do any sacrifice because there was no valid place to sacrifice. They didn't have a true temple. So the Sadducees were like, we're the real Judaism. You guys are a bunch of suckers. You know, you don't get real Judaism. We know what's up. The Pharisees were like, we're the real Judaism. The rest of you, a bunch of suckers. You don't know. We know what's up. The Essenes were like, you guys are heretics. Like you're not Jewish at all. We are the only true Jewish school. So lastly, Josephus tells, and I promise there's a point to all this. It relates to Christianity. Josephus tells us that there is one more school called the zealots. And he says the zealots are like the Pharisees in all things, except they really, really hate the idea of the Roman colonial occupation. So the zealots are, are Pharisees, but they are Pharisees with an extreme political ideology. And for a number of years, they would have these um, sort of gatherings of assassins called Sicarii. And these guys would hide these long knives underneath their cloaks and, and an agreed upon secret signal in a public gathering, you know, big, big festival, thousands of people milling around. They would all pull out their knives and stab a Roman or stab someone collaborating with the Roman and then hide their knives and blend back into the crowd. So the Romans found this justifiably frustrating. They did not like the zealots. They were kind of giving the people of Judea a bad name. And so eventually the Romans started cracking down. They cracked down in incredibly insensitive, brutal, awful ways, and all of Judea rose up against the Roman occupiers. There was a small garrison at, 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 of Roman soldiers in Judea. They overwhelmed them, they killed them, they stole their weapons, and they were like, ha ha, we've beaten the Roman Empire. The governor of Syria immediately sends a big force to Judea to try and quell this uprising, but it's not a big enough force. It's just kind of like, who's, who's on hand? Okay, get in your chariots and ride. So they go to Judea, they too are beaten by this uprising. And they're like, we are undefeatable. This is divine providence. Like no one can, even the might of Rome is nothing compared to these Judean warriors. And then Rome was like, no, we actually didn't send a real army. Now we're gonna send a real army. They send four legions and they just destroy all of this rebellion. In all of this, they capture this guy, Josephus, our, our friend who's telling us about all this, um, but they also destroy the temple. So the holiest place in all of Judaism, the only place that you can do animal sacrifice, grain sacrifice, instant sacrifice, the way humans interact and have communion with God is suddenly gone. It's just erased from the map. So you have this incredible power vacuum in Judaism. So overnight in the year AD 70, I'm not going to like rain dates on you, but if you come away with one date, AD 70, destruction of the temple is a really good one to remember. Overnight, the face of Judaism has to change radically. So before you have the Sadducees in power because they control the temple, suddenly there's no temple. The Essenes kind of fade into nothingness. The Zealots are all completely destroyed by Rome. So all you have left are the Pharisees and one other Jewish group, which Josephus doesn't talk about. What do you think that other Jewish group is in AD 70? Christians. Hey, it's us. Yeah, A plus. Um, so this other Jewish group that you have are the Christians. So if you think about Jesus, this first century rabbi who also happened to be God, and his 12 apostles, they were worshiping in the temple. They were preaching in the synagogue. They were carrying on Judaism. They, we sometimes misread St. Paul and other early church writers through the lens of Martin Luther and through the, the Reformation. And sometimes we want to imagine this kind of strong anti-Semitic bias among early Christians, as though the reason Christianity came along was to do away with Judaism. For the early Christians, that would be completely insane because they saw themselves not as the rival to Judaism, 
but the most faithful school of Judaism. Just as the Pharisees saw themselves as the most faithful school of Judaism, just as before the destruction of the temple, the Essenes and the Sadducees and the Zealots each saw themselves as the most faithful school of Judaism, that was the early Christian perspective. So does anyone know where the term church comes from? So um, in the Old Testament, you have this phrase that's sometimes translated as the great assembly. Do you remember this at all from like Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus? So anytime you have the whole people of God kind of gathered around in formal assembly with God at the center, that is the great assembly. And that word in Hebrew or that phrase in Hebrew is the Kahal Israel. It's the assembly of Israel. It's literally the called out of Israel. It is the, the ones that God has called together, has assembled together. And in about 200 years before the birth of Christ, you have this really important book that comes out. It's called the Septuagint. So before the era that we're talking about, a um, couple of hundred years before Christ, the vast majority of Jewish people did not live in Israel, Palestine. They actually lived in diaspora across the Roman world and even beyond the bounds of the Roman world. So you have Jewish people living all over, predominantly the Eastern half of the Roman world, but also some in the, in the West. And those Jewish people did not primarily speak Hebrew or Aramaic. Instead, they spoke Greek. Greek was the lingua franca of the day. Greek was the language of the marketplace. And if you were living in Alexandria and Egypt, if you were living in Turkey, if modern day Turkey, if you were living in modern day Syria, Greek was very normative. It's the language of commerce, the language of literature and so forth. And so the Septuagint is a Bible that is translated in the Old Testament, uh, initially the Torah, then they add the prophets and some of the writings translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into ancient Greek. This came about, the story goes, because King Ptolemy of Egypt was building the great library at Alexandria, and he wanted all the good stuff. It's like the, there used to be this like Harvard shelf of books. It was like all the good stuff that you need to know, all right here, almost all dead white men, but all on one shelf, everything you got. So King Ptolemy wanted to have all the good stuff. He's like, I want the Persian stuff. I want the Indian stuff. I want the Greek stuff. How about the Jewish stuff? And everyone's like, we can get the Jewish stuff but nobody's going to be able to read it. The Hebrew language, notoriously hard to learn. They only speak it over there in Palestine. We can have a copy, but good luck trying to decipher it. And he's like, well, make me a translation. So King Ptolemy, the story goes, calls together 70 scholars of Judaism. And these scholars are, I imagine each one put in a cubicle with a Remington typewriter and they're all typing away. They're translating the uh, Torah from Hebrew into Greek. And at the same moment, each one dings the final bell on his typewriter. Each one pulls out the last sheet. They're all done at the same time. King Ptolemy starts comparing translation to translation and they're all identical. All 70 translations are exactly the same. Is there some truth to this? Is there zero truth to this? Is it entirely true? I have no idea. It's over 2000 years ago. Who can say? But that, that, this is the story. And on the basis of this, in part, the Septuagint, this official Greek translation of the Old Testament, is considered an inspired translation. So not only is it a translation of inspired texts, the translation itself is inspired. What this means is, if you go to synagogue, basically anywhere outside of Palestine or parts of Syria, you are going to hear the Old Testament read in Greek. And when you're reading from the Septuagint, you can just have the Septuagint read. If for some reason you are in an Aramaic speaking area or in an area that speaks another language, and they have a translation in the local language or the local dialect, you can read that, but then you have to read the Hebrew after. Because that Aramaic translation, that Targum, that's not inspired. That um, Syriac translation, that's not inspired. You still have to have the Hebrew to correct it. If you're reading the Septuagint, it's inspired, you're all good. You can just read it on its own. So um, Septuagint, extremely important text uh, in this era. 
back to the origin of the word church. So we have this great assembly. We have the Kahal Israel. We have the people who have been called out by God to worship God, to have relationship with God, to be the people of God, the Kahal Israel. When the translators of the Septuagint are translating this, this, this word for those who are called out by God, they use the word ecclesia, which literally in Greek means the called out, those who have been chosen out by God from among humanity to be God's people. What do you think ecclesia is in English? The Greek word translated into English. Ecclesiastical. That is an excellent point. Absolutely. So sometimes we actually use ecclesia in um, the sort of non-translated way and we have English words that stem from ecclesia. Um, but when we translate ecclesia into English, we use the word church. So when we are claiming to be the church, we are claiming to be those called out by God from all humanity to be God's people, to be the great assembly of God's people with God at our center. This is exactly how Judaism understood its identity, and this is exactly how Christianity understands its identity. Because again, for Christians, they were like, we're not doing away with Judaism. We are Judaism. <laughs> this is the culmination of Judaism. So there's a really interesting scholar, if you want to get nerdy about this stuff, called Daniel Boyarin. Daniel Boyarin is himself a very faithful Orthodox Jewish man. He is now emeritus at UC Berkeley. He's also taught at um, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's like a big deal in the Jewish studies world. And he has this amazing book called Boundary Lines. And in Boundary Lines, his assertion is there is no clear distinction among the faithful between Judaism and Christianity for the first 500 years of Christianity. Because this is this time when Judaism, in the wake of the absence of the temple, is evolving alongside Christianity. And you have these voices on either side, church leaders, rabbinical leaders, who are really trying to sort of extrapolate the two and say, no, we are not like that, we are like this. No, we are not like that, we are like this. But for the faithful, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of intermingling. And it takes a long time for these two faiths to become sort of teased apart, if that makes sense. So Christianity really starts as this school of Judaism. Before the Pentecost, the apostles look a lot like a lot of us. So Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And they're like, we didn't get any bread for the picnic. And now he's going to be mad at us. He knows we forgot the wonder bread. And Jesus is like, you guys, you're not listening to anything I've been saying. Like they're just so painfully human so much of the time. You know, the crucifixion happens. They run. One of them, maybe John Mark, runs off without his loincloth. They catch hold of his loincloth. He runs off naked because they're like, "We, oh yeah, Peter, I'm going to deny Christ three times. I don't want any part of this. If you're going to kill me, thanks, but no thanks. They are so much like just the rest of us, so painfully human. After the Pentecost, after they are infused with the Holy Spirit, lit on fire with the Holy Spirit, suddenly these 12 apostles, these 70 disciples, these over 500 faithful who meet Christ in the resurrection, they just leave and they go out all across the globe, or at least the known world at the time. So Africa above the Sahara, Persia, India, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, France, Spain, Italian Peninsula, Greece, the Balkans, they just go out into all these completely foreign lands and they show up in random towns and they're like, I don't really speak the language and you've never heard of Judaism, but I'm here to tell you about this guy who was a baby who is actually God, who is executed, but then destroyed death and is the salvation of the world. And everyone's like, I'll buy that. <laughs> and it's in one generation, Christianity is just like all across the known world. It's really just astonishing and mind-blowing and bizarre. And if I think if you're ever thinking like, well, who knows if all this stuff is real, you can stop and ask yourself, how the heck did that happen? It's astonishing. So these apostles, these disciples, they go out across all the world. And fairly quickly, 
as we see in Acts, it's a very unsafe thing to be a Christian. We have the martyrdom of St. Stephen. We eventually have the martyrdom of all the apostles except John. By the year 64, 65, it's becoming illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And even though it's actually like something that carries the death penalty, people are flocking to the church in droves, which is really interesting. So initially you have this Jewish group going out to find the synagogue, or like in today's Acts reading, find the place where Jewish people are praying together and telling these Jewish people about the Messiah who they've been expecting, who has come, who is not only a great leader, but who is himself God incarnate. But then, well, okay, well, I'll back up a tiny bit. In Judaism, you have this idea of various ages. So you have the age of the creation of humanity, of Adam and Eve, the garden. You have this age of chaos, which kind of goes from um, the Cain and Abel period through um, the covenant with Abraham. You have this period of the law, which is given at Sinai, the age of Torah. And then you have the age of the Messiah. So in the kind of age of chaos, so between the fall and the covenant with Abraham or the giving of the law, what you know about God is sort of like looking around at the universe and you're like, well, it's sure beautiful. I mean, it doesn't seem that chaotic. Maybe there's some order to all this. You know, I guess murder is wrong. You have these sort of basic intuitions about God, this natural theology. In the age of Torah, in the age of covenant, you have this specific revelation of God to God's people, to this kind of one group of humanity. In the mess Messianic age for first century Jewish people, in the Messianic age, you would have the revelation of God to all people. And part of the vocation of Judaism is to reveal God to all God's people, all humanity, and draw all people to God. And the Messiah will do this. So for the church, we have entered into the Messianic age, in which it's not just about one group that has a very special job to do. It's about all humanity coming into one in Christ and being in this direct relationship with the Father. So fairly soon, you have these people who are coming to the river to find the Jewish group to pray. They start reaching out beyond the Jewish group and bringing Gentiles into the church. Does anybody remember the, the Council of Jerusalem in Acts and what happens there when Paul and Peter have to kind of like hash it out with the other disciples about Gentiles? Oh, I remember it was about uh, whether you could eat with Gentiles was one of the things. That's, yeah, that's, that sort of plays into it. A big thing was circumcision. Like, do you have to be circumcised to be a Christian? Um, and what it came down to is, no, you don't have to be circumcised, but you do have to do three things. What are those kind of three ritual things to be a Gentile Christian? Baptism. Baptism wasn't one of them. That's certainly a, an essential part of being a Christian. But there was these three ritual things from Judaism, which you had to do uh, to be a Gentile Christian. Circumcision. So, so actually, to be a Christian, you don't have to be circumcised. Little known fact. <laughs> no, I mean, in the past. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just giving you a hard time. So basically they said, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to keep kosher. You don't have to keep all the purity laws. You have to maintain moral purity. So you have to keep the 10 commandments. You have to give to the poor. You have to be a good person, obviously. But there were, there were some specific things from the Jewish purity laws that you had to do. So one was never to bow down to an idol, no idolatry. One was avoiding, um, what one Episcopal theologian, Bill Countryman, who was uh, the professor of several people in this virtual room, translates as harlotry, having uh, this total disconnection from sexuality and holiness. So avoid fornication, harlotry. And then the third was not eating meat with blood in it. You pick like all the Jewish law and you avoid like blood sausage. Why is that such a big deal? Why did they pick these three? Does anybody have any idea? 
idolatry, avoiding fornication or harlotry, not eating blood. Please, there's a hand in the back. Health and safety, health and safety. Health not and safety. even, not even close. I mean, idolatry, that's a good one for health and safety. If you're worshiping idols, like your life's going to be bad. But the other two, no. The harlotry and, and food with blood would be a, a kind of how the pagans worshiped, right? Uh, so you don't want to do that. I think that's a really interesting perspective. And I think that's very helpful. That's a, I think that's, that's part of the background for sure. However, all of this stuff actually comes from the Old Testament. So if you are a Gentile living in Israel, you have to maintain moral purity and you have to follow three Jewish purity laws, avoiding idolatry, not eating blood, which is the life of the animal and sexual immorality, pornea, uh, fornication, harlotry, whatever you want to call it. So these are the three things that a Gentile living in Israel had to do in, under Judaism from way long time ago in the Old Testament. So what a Gentile Christian has to do now is live under these same strictures. So St. Paul doesn't say, I used to be a Pharisee. I used to be perfect under the law. He says, I am a Pharisee. I am perfect under the law. St. Paul doesn't like give up on being Jewish, give up on being circumcised, give up on keeping kosher. But Gentiles are now invited into Israel, and they're living under these guidelines for Gentiles living within Israel. And that's what Gentiles in the church look like. And this was taken so seriously that in the first few centuries of Christianity, people Romans used to taunt Christians by offering them blood sausage. Because Christians are like, I can't do that. That's like cardinal rule, no eating blood, the life of the animal, that I can't eat. So this, this kind of style of being a Gentile Christian became more and more a part of Christian identity. All of this comes to a head in various areas when you're getting um, set artificial separations of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. You see this in uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans in which the Jewish Christians have been exiled by the Emperor Claudius. They come back. The Roman, the Gentile Christians have been doing things a different way, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you guys have done Bible studies on Romans. Um, anyway, so you have the Pentecost, the apostles, the disciples, they go out all the world. And in one generation, the church becomes this kind of fully formed thing. So I'll stop here, please, Father. Uh, Felicia Gaddis has raised her hand in oh, please. the virtual chat. This is what I get for staring at the room with the people in it. Please, Felicia. Uh, I was just going to say, what was the issue then with Paul? Because he made a statement about circumcision. There was a debate, I guess, about that, about whether uh, a non-Jew had to be circumcised. And he said something about he hoped the hand of the circumciser slipped. So, um, so I think that's a really important point. So this is exactly that period that I'm thinking about. And Paul is so pivotal in all these discussions. So you have one party within early Christianity that's saying, okay, if you want to be Christian, if you want to be a Christian, get circumcised, have your bar mitzvah, get two sets of plates, the milk plates and the meat plates, like become Jewish, and then you can become a Christian. And then you have this other party who's saying like, but it's, he's a light unto all nations. Like it's not just about one group of people or one culture. It's actually about drawing the whole world to God in Christ. Um, so you have this early debate going back and forth. And the, the group that won are the latter party. So the, the party of Paul, which eventually he sways Peter over to the other disciples at the first council of Jerusalem. They come to this conclusion that as long as Gentiles are going to live by the rules set forth for Gentiles to live within Israel under, then you can be a Gentile Christian. But yeah, I think that's so important to kind of bring up. That's literally the moment where all that stuff goes down. I see another hand raised, please. Um, well, that is so interesting. I had no idea. I've heard of those three law rules, but I didn't know where they came from. Where in um, the Hebrew Bible are those? They're in Leviticus. Okay. I, off the top of my head, 
I'm not one of those people who can be like John 14, 67 or whatever, but like, I think it's maybe like somewhere on the 21st chapter of Leviticus, but I'll leave that for wiser heads than my own or to Google actually, which is very helpful. Um, any other questions before I continue yammering at you? I will say if anybody is behind me in the room that I can't see your hands, just speak so that I can, <laughs> so we don't have the problem like that before. So I thought we'd get into a little bit about once we have these mixed communities of Gentile and Jewish Christians, or in some places where there is no Jewish community of just Gentile Christians, what was that worship like? So have you ever heard about a house church? When I thought of house churches before I started studying history, I thought of probably some ratty couches and maybe an acoustic guitar and people like drinking cups of coffee and saying some prayers, maybe reading from Bibles with zippers on them. Um, not what a Roman house church was like. So I think I'm able to share my screen. Let me give it a shot. So can you guys see this? Is it, okay. Yes. So this is, this is what's called a domus. Um, so in ancient Rome, well, okay, so today, if you um, are just sort of transported to modern day Malawi or um, modern day Siberia or modern day Dubai or modern day Tokyo or modern day Los Angeles, you're just set down in a street and things look really different from place to place. People are dressed differently. The architecture is different. The language is different. The smells are different. Like, Everything is different in these various places. Is there snow? Do people wear wraps on their heads? Do people wear baggy pants? Like what, whatever it is, everything is different. However, if you get, if you fly into the airport in uh, Dubai, or if you fly into an airport in Malawi, or if you fly into an airport in Sydney or Los Angeles or whatever, you're gonna be able to find the baggage carousel because all the airports are basically the same. Signage can be different, shops are different, layout's a bit different, but it's basically an airport no matter where you go. Is that fair to say? Ancient Romans lived in houses that were like airports. So the majority of ancient Romans who lived in cities lived in apartment buildings called insulas. They were like tenement apartment buildings, didn't have kitchens, very small living space. But if you were a person of privileged, you lived in what was called the domus. And we have, we've discovered domus, we have had these Roman houses in um, far reaches of the Middle East, in far reaches of the UK, in the Italian peninsula, in France, in Greece, all over the place. Everywhere you go, there were privileged Romans. They would build exactly the same house with the same floor plan. Can you see my little cursor here? Uh, I don't know if you see my cursor. Is that visible? Okay. So you would, end, this is the, the side of the domus that faces the street. And it's just, it's basically just like a wall. It's meant to be fortress-like. You have a big heavy door. You go through this little vestibule and you're in this area called the atrium, the atrio. And the atrium has this, uh, this little pool of water here called an impluvium. And you can kind of see this on the silly little um, artist rendering. You can see that the sky is open to that area and there's this pool of water here. The artist has stuck flowers in it. I don't think there were typically flowers in a, an impluvium. Um, but this is a reservoir of water that can use if the aqueduct is cut off, if there's a problem, if you need to wash clothes, if you need water for the animals, drinking water, whatever. You'll find it here in this pool in the atrium. The next room back, you see this T here above the A? That's a room called the tablinum. And the tablinum, I'm gonna uh, just get rid of this image. The tablinum is a room that we don't have an equivalent to in basically non-Roman houses. So the only equivalent that I've ever come up with is a room in my grandmother's house. So my grandmother in Lubbock, Texas had a kitchen and she had a dining room and she had a living room where the couches were and the TV was. She had bedrooms, she had bathrooms. And then at the front of the house, there was this other room. And it had this 
pristine white carpet. It was whiter than snow. It was like it had never been trod upon. There was this couch that I'm sure she bought in like, you know, 1959 that looked like it had never been sat on. And there was this wooden table that was so polished. It was like, you know, blinding reflected sunlight. And on this table, there was this crystal bowl full of peppermints. And it was just put there to torture grandchildren because you knew you could not go into this parlor and you could not take one of those candies, but you could like see it through the doorway. I don't think anybody ever sat in this room, but like if Lyndon Baines Johnson had come and knocked on the door, this is the room he would have been ushered into. It was like this ceremonial space in her house. Um, this is a little bit like a tablinum. So the tablinum is not the dining room, it's not the kitchen, it's not the garden, it's not the bedroom, it's not the bathroom. It is like its own ritual room. And the tablinum has a big table, it's kind of desk, stone table. Behind that is a big chair. And then along the walls, there might be rows of columns. And behind those columns, you might have kind of family relics. You might have the death masks of ancestors. You might have important things to the family. But this is the room where sort of like Roman culture was on display. The pagan gods of the household, those were kept in the atrium. Those might be kept in the garden. This, this room was less about sort of pagan worship than it was about just this kind of like Roman symbolic space. We know that it was used for a couple of specifically Roman things. One was business meetings. So if you are, um, let's say you're a shipping merchant and I go to your house because I wanna conduct business, I wanna put some of my grain on one of your boats, I would come into the tablinum and I would stand before the, the desk there. You would sit behind the chair and we would negotiate business over the desk. The other thing that it was used for was the family assembly. And family assembly sounds like I don't know, family picnic or whatever. It was not that. A Roman family assembly was this extremely regimented, extremely symbolic and extremely important event in the life of a Roman household. So for a family assembly, the pater familias, the dad of the family would sit in the big chair behind the desk. And the most, the eldest son would be standing on his right, the second eldest on his left, the third eldest, to the right of the one on the right, the fourth to the one on the left of the left, and so forth. You would have the rest of the household standing facing the Potter Familius. On the left side of the room, you would have his eldest brother standing first, and the younger, younger, younger brothers. Behind them, there might be cousins, oldest to youngest, and behind them, there might be free household servants or people associated uh, under sort of patronage with the house, and behind them, enslaved people men only on the left. On the right, you would have his wife, the most important woman of the household. Next to her, maybe his eldest sister, and so on, back to enslaved women. So you have this very rigid assembly. So when you start having Christian worship services in a Roman domus, where do you think they would hold those services? What room? It's not a trick question, super easy. The tablinum. So they, they, they're, they're having them in this ceremonial space that already exists. And there's already this structure for what a ceremony in a tablinum looks like. And so what do you think Christian worship looks like? It looks like a Roman family assembly. So we have a wonderful document from St. Justin Martyr writing in 165, in which he explains what Roman worship looks or Christian worship looks like to a non-Christian audience. So he describes being in this sort of tablinum-like space, and there is this big desk, and there is a big chair behind the desk, and who do you think sits in that chair instead of the Potter Familius? Priest. The priest. Yeah, the, it's the bishop initially. So it's the bishop, although in, in Justin Martyr's time by 165, you're absolutely right. It's a priest. He actually uses the word rector. He says the rector sits in that chair, the ruler. And then, so if it's a bishop, he would have his priests standing around him and his deacons standing around him. If it is the priest, he would have assisting clergy or other deacons standing around that chair. And then facing him, you have 
on one side, the men, and on the other side, the women. The difference, Justin says, is that there is no order of importance among who stands where. So you don't have enslaved people in the back and free people at the front. You don't have older, richer people in the front and poorer, younger people at the back. So much so that Justin, who's an authority in the church, he's the great Christian philosopher. When Justin talks, people listen. Justin says that the norm is that if it's totally packed and there's nowhere to stand and a beggar comes in, a really poor person, the bishop should get up and give that beggar his seat because that beggar is Christ. In Christ, there is no man or woman, there is no slave or free, there is no Jew or Gentile, all are one in Christ. So it's like a Roman family assembly, and it's also, from the Roman perspective, an insane, horrific perversion of the family assembly, in which people are being given equality in the world's most class-stratified society. Um, so you have people worshiping in this way. You have, Justin tells us, initially some prayers, you have the singing of psalms, and you have readings initially from the Old Testament. So before Justin's time, this is also the case, you have these prayers, you have singing of psalms, you have readings from the Old Testament, and then you have a sermon. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound like what you guys did like an hour ago? Sounds like what I did this morning. So in the early church, there is no New Testament. The New Testament either hasn't been written yet or certainly hasn't been compiled and distributed yet. So you have readings from the Old Testament, and then you have a sermon. But in the very early church, the person giving that sermon is St. Matthew, or it's St. Mark, or it's St. John, or it's St. Luke, or it's St. Paul, or it's St. Philip, or it's St. Andrew, or it's St. Peter. So you have the apostles themselves, or the, the 70 disciples, or people who followed Christ, who we don't know about in the New Testament, because they we're told there are at least 500 to whom Christ appears after his resurrection. That's the one giving the sermon. So you have a reading from Isaiah, and a reading from Exodus, and then you have St. John getting up and saying like, you know, I remember this one time we were in the temple, and that same passage was read, and here's what Christ said about it. And so, not only are they sort of telling anecdotes about their time living with Christ and learning from Christ, they're also talking about who the Old Testament is actually about. And for the early church, the Old Testament was all about Jesus, not about foretelling the coming of Jesus. It wasn't like a prophecies of Nostradamus, you know, on this year, this thing will happen and the Messiah will come. It was literally who gave the tablets of the law who inscribed them with his finger, the pre-incarnate Christ, who spoke from Mo to Moses out of the burning bush, the pre-incarnate Christ, who was the rock from which Israel drank, the pre-incarnate Christ, who was the angel of the Lord who led Israel in the desert, the pre-incarnate Christ, everything for the early church was about Jesus. So when they're talking about Judaism being fulfilled in Christ, they're not being sort of metaphoric, like, well, you know, we don't need the laws anymore because now we're Christians. They're literally talking about everything is fulfilled. The whole Old Testament is fulfilled in this person of Jesus. So you don't have a New Testament. You have the gospel from the lips of Christ's disciples. Does this make sense? So after that sermon, you'd have some more prayers, prayers of the people. They didn't have the creed yet. And then anyone who is not baptized would have to leave. Because the prayer of the Eucharist was not the magic trick that the priest did at the altar. The prayer of the Eucharist was the prayer of the body of Christ, of those who have been baptized into the body of Christ, those who are one with Christ through baptism. So the body of Christ would pray together silently as the priest or the bishop prayed aloud, and the Holy Spirit would come and consecrate the bread and the wine to become the body and blood of Christ. This is what Justin says, writing in 165. So if you are not baptized, if you're not part of the body of Christ, you are not part of the body of Christ, praying as the body of Christ, receiving the body of Christ, becoming the body of Christ. That was, that's what happens in the Eucharist. Um, so the non-baptized leave, 
and they go maybe to the atrium, maybe they go out to Denny's for breakfast, I don't know what they do, but the baptized, the unbaptized are not there. The baptized body of Christ gather around the altar. Baptisms can happen any time in any place, like Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, but the most traditional time for a baptism is the great vigil of Easter. It's the night before Easter, the first service of Easter. And if you're going to baptize someone in a Roman house, where do you think they would do it? Yeah, that impluvium, the gesture was enough. That's right. So you have, you have, I imagine St. John's, you certainly have Grace Georgetown from day one. You know, you have the chair at the front, you have the altar at the front, you have the rows of people, you have the baptistry at the back. This comes from the Roman house. And a lot of this comes from scholarship of Dom Gregory Dix, who's an Anglican Benedictine, Church of England Benedictine, who is writing um, in the early part of the 20th century. His scholarship became hugely influential, influenced Roman Catholicism, influenced to some extent Ethan Orthodoxy, influenced all the Protestant traditions. Um, but it's really interesting to see how this pattern of our liturgy, the style of worship, is really inherent from day one in the apostolic tradition and what was being done by the apostles, not just in Rome, but in rural Ethiopia, in middle of nowhere, South India, in middle of nowhere, Germany and France, like all over the place, anywhere the apostles went, this style of worship, this theology of worship, this kind of liturgy is put in place. And so this is why you can go all over the world and anytime you find apostolic Christians, whether it's in Ethiopia, whether it's in you know Russia or France or whatever, we worship in a very similar manner. It's this apostolic tradition passed down from generation to generation. Father, please. For those of us who are local, you can visit a Roman domus. You could go today if you want. You can go to the Getty Villa and go to the Roman street on which is the door, like you're suggesting, you walk into it and right there's the atrium and the impluvium, everything pristinely created like a villa that came out of Herculeum in the first century. That is so cool. So now you all have your homework assignment. <laughs> and Father, are we going to uh, 15 past the hour? Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, we can go for about like 10 minutes or so further. Okay, that okay. sounds good. So we'll talk a little bit about that worship, and then we'll maybe leave a few minutes for questions or thoughts or critiques or whatever. Um, so you have um, this liturgy of the word, which is happening, which is so much like our liturgy of the word, except that it, rather than uh, one of your clergy at St. John's, it's actually St. John the Apostle who's giving the sermon. As time goes on, you have people, disciples, Christians who are like, St. John's getting really old. Somebody better write this stuff down. And so you either have, according to the church's understanding, you have disciples writing down their own teaching, their own sermons, like St. John and St. Matthew, or you have the disciples of disciples, like St. Mark and St. Luke, writing down the preaching of Peter in the case of St. Mark and the preaching of Paul in the case of St. Luke. So you have fairly early on these um, collections of writings. Um, I won't, we can get into sort of origin of the New Testament and the kind of debates around that if you want to, but um, suffice it to say, there is no, there are no New Testament writings before the late 50s or early 60s when Paul is writing his letters. Um, and then you have no actual New Testament canon of scripture really until the end of the fourth century. So like hundreds of years after this period, do you have the Bible? So if you're going back to the Bible to say like, um, okay, we're going to just read, we're going to throw everything out. We're going to start from scratch and we are going to just do worship as they did in the Bible. It's very problematic because these texts are being written to be read in the context of ongoing worship that is already being done like you do it at St. John's. So if you're trying to, it's sort of like, um, you know, if, uh, if I download a program, I'm going to get this like readme file that says like, double click on this file, drag it to your applications folder, open the program, you know, put in your license key or whatever. It's not going to say, okay, 
there's this thing called a computer and it's got a screen and it's got a keyboard and they're connected. And when you hit the keys on the keyboard, it's gonna tell the computer what to do because I know all that. I've, I'm downloading this program to use on a computer. In the same way, the Bible doesn't contain everything about what it is to be the church because it's being written to be read in the context of the liturgy, in the context of the church. So you have the liturgy of the word, which is very much focused on prayers, scripture, the sermon, then all the unbaptized leave, and you have the liturgy of the altar, the liturgy of the table, it's sometimes called. And this liturgy of the word really looks a lot like first century, second century, third century synagogue liturgy. This is very much like what's happening in the synagogue, because the synagogue and the church are kind of co-evolving at the same time. So you have this very synagogue-like liturgy, and then you have something that looks nothing like what happens in the synagogue. So where does this liturgy of the Eucharist come from? It, if, it's, if these are Jewish people following Jewish tradition, doing Jewish things, but it has nothing to do with synagogue worship, where do you think that could have come from? What's the other big, really significant building in early Judaism? Not the synagogue, but... The temple. So the temple is the place of sacrifice. We think of sacrifice as being like either making an animal suffer or giving a god food to eat. That's not the Jewish understanding of sacrifice at all. Sacrifice is a meal of communion with God. It is sharing that which God has blessed us with. It is returning it to him for his blessing. And then it is sharing that together with God. So for early Christians, all the temple sacrifice is summed up in the Eucharist. In a proper church, unlike my own, but like St. John's, you have incense every Sunday because incense is an essential part of temple sacrifice. And you have the sacrifice of bread and wine that is the body and blood of Christ. So the most common sacrifices in the temple, in part, were the grain offering, the drink offering, the peace offering, the thank offering. You have these sacrifices of blood. You have these bloodless sacrifices. All of this gets summed up in the Eucharist, in this meal of Holy Communion with God. So from day one, they're doing this temple ritual as just the body of Christ, receiving the body of Christ, becoming the body of Christ. And all those sacrifices, the Passover, the atonement, all of that summed up in the sacrifice of the Eucharist. So it's not doing away with Judaism. It is seeing Christian worship as the fulfillment of Judaism. It has to be said, our Jewish brothers and sisters would be like, that's nuts. We're the fulfillment of Judaism. We're still just doing Pharisaic Judaism. And we have to completely respect them and just agree to disagree because we're two different traditions. Doesn't mean we can't love them, marry each other, work on projects together, be best friends, but we're two different traditions. So we, there are things we disagree on. Um, so you kind of have to hold, hold those things in tension. Did I see a hand up in the room? Yeah. Please. Um, what's the difference between, you said, the, the things that weren't practiced in the synagogue were practiced in the temple. I've kind of morphed the two together. So what is the difference between the synagogue and the temple? Oh, that's a great question. So in synagogue worship, it really is in the first century, we think, because again, a lot of this is conjecture, but we think a, a first century synagogue liturgy really looked like some prayers, some singing of hymns or psalms, some readings, a sermon, some more prayers, everybody goes home. So it's, it's very liturgy of the word like. The temple liturgy is you come to the area outside the temple, you buy a goat, you go take a ritual bath, you bring your goat into the temple, um, you as a woman stand in the court of the women and you give it to an attendant to be taken through the court of the Israel into the court of the Levites. They sacrifice this, this animal on your behalf. Part of the sacrifice is either done something with in the temple, given to the priest, burnt, left on the altar, whatever it is. Part of the sacrifice is given back to you for you to take home and consume. Um, depending on the kind of sacrifice. But the temple is all about sacrificial worship. It's, it's sacrifice. So the temple has all these different areas. You have 
the court of the Gentiles, which is anybody can come, you know, Hindu, Christian, whatever, you're welcome. You have the court of women, which is only for Jewish women. You have the court of Israel, which is only for Jewish men. You have the court of the Levites, which is only for the kind of broad Levitical priesthood, which corresponds to our order of deacons. They're the, the people who are the doorkeepers. They carry and hold things. They sing parts of the liturgy. They proclaim things in the liturgy. Then you have the holy place, which is only for the Kohanes, the actual priests, which correspond to our priesthood. Um, that is where the altar of incense is. This corresponds to the chancel in a church like St. John's, the area behind the altar rail. Um, this is where the altar of the showbread is, where there's this grain sacrifice um, of loaves of bread, much like communion, called the, the bread of the presence of God or the face of God. This is where historically the menorah was. This is where the uh, oil of anointing was. It's the super, super, super holy stuff. And then you have the holy of holies. You have this space that's partitioned off by this curtain, which represents like the physical world reality. And when you enter into the holy of holies, you are maybe symbolically, maybe actually, we don't know, you are leaving time and space and you're entering into God's eternity. The Holy of Holies is Eden. The Holy of Holies is the time before time began. The Holy of Holies is what is uh, thought of in Jewish mythology as, as day one, the day before creation. So or the day, the first day of creation, you were entering into the space where heaven and earth meet as one, where God is, the holiness of God is tangibly present. Um, but nobody goes into the Holy of Holies except the high priest who corresponds to our order of bishops once a year. And in later Judaism, there was a tradition, this isn't something we find reflected in early writings, but there's a tradition that the, the high priest had a rope tied around himself when he went into the Holy of Holies. Because when you look God, see God face to face, you're probably going to die. So they'll need to pull him out. So there's not a dead body in the Holy of Holies. So nobody can go back there. And the Holy of Holies corresponds to our tabernacle, right? The place where we keep the presence of Christ, the physical presence of Christ sanctifying our space. So the temple ritual looks very different from synagogue ritual. That's a great question. We have just a couple Please. moments for uh, another question. Suzanne? Um, what did they do if um, there was nobody in the congregation who had a domus? That's a great question. Um, so we have lots of different models of what churches were like, but they still kind of follow the same pattern of worship. So it's less about the domus having to be necessary to have worship. And it's more that this kind of um, architectural configuration influences Christian worship from day one. And so Christian worship can happen in, in different types of buildings. Um, you have Christian worship happening in domus, in, in, in ah, what's the plural of domus, domici, domiciles. Um, you have Christian worship happening in rooms other than the tablinum, but it's still the sort of tablinum style worship. And you have worship in other places that aren't, aren't domuses at all, uh, but it's still following the same liturgical pattern. I think we have a question in the back here from James and then also. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, it's I a pleasure, thanks for asked, having me. Uh, this is a little bit of a sci-fi question. When you mentioned the Holy of Holies, and that's uh, potentially the beginning of time, is it possible that when one enters into the Holy of Holies, that they could be entering each time into a different dimension? Whoa, it's a trippy question. I have no idea. Um, but like long, long story short, um, there's kind of a, a Judeo-Christian distinction between um, space-time. So, you know, Einstein helped us understand that space and time are a continuum rather than two discrete phenomena and infinity eternity. So if you look at the mathematical concept of in infinity, infinity is not just like, um, like every point between point A and point B, it's infinitely beyond that. Such that like um, the mathematician Anthony Moore has this great example in one of his books that if you're on like a long, tedious bus trip, you can't wait to take a shower, just get off this Greyhound bus. You go to the nearest motel after you get off the bus. They are just turning off the vacancy sign as you arrive and you're like, no, I can't believe it. I'm so sick of being on this bus. I really just want to get into my room. And you uh, notice a sign on the door that says, 
Plato's Place, um, Los Angeles' first infinite motel. Then, then you go up to the counter and you're like, hey, it's an infinite motel. Can't I have a room? Is there something you can do? And you like slide the lady a $20 bill. She can actually call the person in room one and have him move to room two and call the lady in room two and have her move to room three and call the lady in room three and have her move to room four and so forth infinitely. And even though there's an infinite number of people occupying an infinite number of rooms, there's still room for you because infinity goes infinitely beyond all constraints of space. So when exiting space time and entering into the infinite and the eternal, the reality of God, there is, it's not a question of a different space time or a different dimension or a different kind of spatiotemporal reality. It is the opposite of those things which are way above our pay grade. So God is fully present to every point in time and space, but infinitely beyond them. I think Paul had a question. Um, two quick questions, please. Um, the Catholic Church, where does it fit into this? Um, I might be jumping ahead of you know our, ourselves here. And then secondly, you mentioned uh, uh, the Eucharist. Um, now we don't kind of, I believe we don't um, dwell on just baptized people. When did that concept change kind of? It's a great question. So um, I'll be real quick in these answers because I don't want, I could keep you guys here for another like 14 hours answering those two very good questions. Um, but I'll just very quickly say, <laughs> that we we still do um we still do give communion to the baptized so that's we if in my tradition in my church every sunday i say um for those of you who are visiting in the episcopal church all baptized christians are welcome to receive the sacrament of holy communion so if you're roman catholic or methodist non-denominational episcopalian lutheran we hope you'll come and join us to receive the sacrament of christ's body and blood but we we do actually canonically restrict the holy eucharist to the baptized where the Roman Catholic Church fits in um, is a much bigger, longer question. Uh, <laughs> but suffice to say, at this point, there are no various branches of Christianity. There's just Christianity. And it looks somewhat different from place to place and somewhat similar from place to place. There are lots of commonalities. There are some differences. Um, and we can kind of get into some of those next time and maybe set the stage for talking about uh, the Roman Catholic tradition and how that differs from the Eastern Orthodox and the Anglican or Episcopal tradition. But one thing to say about that is that I think your question might have been that we no longer exclude the baptized from the assembly. <sighs> Ah, uh, um, yes. Yeah, that, we have, that a, happens we have a rubric in our bulletin that also invites all baptized Christians to, to, uh, to the Lord's table. Um, uh, but, but you're right. And in fact, that is the teaching of the church that all, it, it, you can be baptized in any Christian tradition and come to the Lord's table, which is different from the Roman Catholic Church. But, but there is the, the barrier, let's say, or the bar or the, or the, the that, only those who are baptized receive the Lord's body and blood. I think. Absolutely. You, did you, were you raising a question? Okay. okay. We have one more question from Deacon Margaret. Please. It's not really a question. I visited Montego Bay probably 30 years ago, and I wanted to go to church. And one of the ladies at the, uh, in, in this hotel put me in her car Sunday morning and took me way back up in the hills. I dared not get out because I didn't know where I was. And when I got there to this little Anglican church, which didn't even have any sides to it, there was my church service. It was amazing. The Episcopal church was in that little, I don't know where I was, to be perfectly honest. And I kept a good hold on that woman so she didn't go off and leave me. But just what you said, it was the same service. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I think that I'm, I'm sure any of us who have traveled to other countries and visited other Anglican parishes have had that same experience of just like, oh my gosh, I have nothing in common with these people. And yet I have everything in common with these people. <laughs> like we're exactly the same because we are just part of this one church. But even in a more extreme way, I was in an Egyptian monastery once with all these brothers from Cairo and we were like talking, they were trying to understand like, what's the Episcopal church? What are you talking? What do you mean you're a priest? And they were like, oh, wait, are you an apostolic tradition? And I was like, yeah, we are. And he's like, oh yeah, it's the same. It's the same. 
And even though they all look like these, you know, medieval wizards, they have these like black cloaks and these long white beards and they're really intense. Theologically, we were identical. Our understanding of the sacraments was identical. Just like everything exactly the same. It's crazy. We're going to, we luckily get to have you come back next week. And, um, you know, I hope, I hope you can maybe unpack for us a little bit of the theology of that early community as to why the unbaptized were invited, you know, to, you talked a little bit about that, to invited to, uh, to leave the assembly at that point, and then maybe um, theology of baptism in the early church is part of what you talk about next week. Um, Happy to. Yeah. Do so you that, know the I think name be... of, the, of, the, of the Jewish scholar who was talking about that there's no difference, there was no difference for the first 500 years between the Jewish people. What was his name again? Yeah, and I wouldn't totally say no difference, but like it just took a really long time to sort of extricate Christianity and Judaism and draw those like hard boundary lines. His last name is Boyarin. I think it's B-O-Y-A-R-I-N. Daniel is his first name. Okay. And I think most of his stuff is UC Berkeley Press. Uh, his, his books are super easy to find. They're all on Amazon or whatever. Thank if you. Maybe, He's awesome. Maybe what Sorry. you could do if you could write up a couple of, uh, as you make these comments, if you can just like books that you're suggesting. Um, Absolutely. Just send, send them off to us as well. Well, Bernie, thank you. This has been wild. Dude, <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> Very deep. <laughs> well thanks for having me this is such a blessing for me it's really fun forward to time seeing with you next week yes indeed i'll see you on sunday okay bye for now all right bye-bye thank you